All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a few quick announcements. There will be a Titus II Women's Fellowship event today at 3 o'clock. So bring a friend and a treat to share. Um, also, uh, on April 28th, there will be a quarterly business meeting. So um, if you're uh, a member, be sure to attend that. We have some membership to vote on on that. So um, be sure to be there for that. And we will also be discussing our new mission and vision statement that uh, the elders and Shane have labored over for over a year. So, um, yeah, uh, Myron and Shane and Dakota and Ray and Alan um, and Ozzy really worked hard on that. So um, there is a copy of it on that table in the back. So feel free to pick one of those up. Uh, you can you can check it out and. Um, we'll be discussing that more at the business meeting. So, <clears throat> um, if you are interested in serving in the in our women's ministry, please contact Zoe Taylor. She's hiding out in the foyer. So, if anybody doesn't know Zoe, she's right there. She's coming in. There she is. It's probably chilly in here, so she's probably going to retreat right back out there. So, um, and then also on the twenty eighth. Um, are we doing the family chore with the business meeting? At, okay, at, at 2. 2. Okay, at 2 o'clock on the 28th, we will do family chores Sunday. Um, it says, please dress for painting. You know what? If you want to wear your paint clothes to church, that's fine, too. Um, we don't care, right? Yeah. So um, as long as they don't have wet paint on them, you know, don't sit in the seats with wet paint, right? Um, that could be an awkward hug. Yes. Um, Let's see, uh, the um, donations for Hope Dealers and for Operation Christmas Child, Hope Dealers is granola bars and cookies, Operation Christmas Child is hygiene products. Um, the window over there, last week I said the hub is through the window. Clint said, you know, tell people not to go through the window. So if you look through the window, you can see the hub go through the door that is outside in the, in the hallway. So, um, thank you. I've been, I've been waiting for Caleb to do that for me. I, I was going to cue him one of these times on a really bad joke. So, um, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and stand and do our monthly memory verse. Mark fourteen sixty two, And Jesus said, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Mark 14, 62. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we, th we thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, just uh, uh, providing for us, Lord, for just uh, uh, your hand being over us uh, uh, all day, every day, every week. Lord, we thank you so much for just... Uh, uh, everything you do for us. Lord, we pray for um, just this community. We pray for uh, our missions that, that we support. Lord, we pray for um, just everybody that, that reaches the lost, Lord, like you've, you've asked us to do. Lord, we pray for uh, just boldness. We pray for your spirit to go forward to prepare hearts. And, and, and Lord, we, we pray for the boldness to share your good news. Lord, uh, we, we love you. We, we pray for uh, just a lost and dark world. We pray that we could be the light. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, church. I don't know about you, but there's just something about lifting our voices as the, the saints together, isn't there? Man, that chorus together just brings a tear to my eye. How amazing it is to sing with the saints in praise and worship our God. If you're new here, I just want to welcome you. My name is Shane. I'm the pastor here. And uh, we have been going through a series called A Good King Goes to War. This is the end of the book of Mark. Um, and we've been in Mark a good long while, and don't worry for those of you, we will end it one day. But it is not this day, okay? We have some good stuff to unpack today in God's Word, but as we do, I got a question for you. How many of you embarrass easily? Anybody embarrass easily? I know this may be a surprise to you all, but when I was a kid, I embarrassed pretty easily. In fact, so much so, do anybody remember the movie Little Rascals? You remember that movie? 
I could not, and to this day, still struggle watching that movie because I'd get so embarrassed for Alfalfa when he had to run through and swim through the pool and he lost his underwear. That just, I cannot handle that scene. I get so embarrassed for him. I get embarrassed easily. And sometimes that can hold us back, can't it? I want to share a video with you about a time that our embarrassment could hold us back. It's a movie that came out quite a while ago now. Anybody remember the Courageous movie? Do you remember that movie? Here's a quick scene from that movie, and I will unpack it. I'm not getting you one. I've heard this before. Who is it? Oh, sweetie, what are you doing? Come dance with me. Emily, this is a parking lot. This is not where people dance. Daddy, please, just for this song, come dance with me, Daddy, please. Emily, people can see us. It's okay, they don't mind, Daddy. They don't care, Daddy. Tell you what, you dance right here and I'll watch. <sighs> okay. Okay, when you're ready to dance, this is what you do. First, you put your right hand around my waist like this. Then you hold your other hand out like this. Then we sway back and forth to the music. When we're together. <laughs> and you can spin. Are you sure you don't want to dance? I'd like a castle on a hill. <laughs> I'm dancing with you in my heart, sweetie. <laughs> Emily, you're trying to teach your dad how to dance. He won't dance with me. That's because he's a fuddy-duddy with no sense of style. All right, everybody in the car, Mr. Fuddy-duddy's leaving. Your Highness. Thank you. Emily, who taught you how to dance? Because I know it wasn't. So the reason I share that video uh, is if you've anybody seen the movie, it, it yeah, watching it a second time almost that scene brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Because if you know later on in the movie, uh, that little girl goes on a sleepover and gets in a car wreck and she passes away. And I, I spoiled the end. I'm sorry. It's an older movie. I thought it'd be okay because it was an older movie. But there's a redeeming feature, and we'll get to that at the end. I want to share with you the redeeming feature of that. But I think many of us, many of us, we get embarrassed in that moment when God is inviting us to pour out in worship to Him. We get embarrassed. There's something that keeps us back. There's something that holds us back from pouring out our lives. And we're going to look at a, a, a woman, a young woman, who's going to kind of push past this level of embarrassment, and she's going to lavishly worship Jesus in front of the disciples, and the disciples are going to become kind of embarrassed and uncomfortable as well. So let's go ahead, let's read Mark 14, 3. Mark, Mark 14, 3. I think a lot of us, embarrassment holds us back, much like that man in the video. Mark 14, 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of anoint, anointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always, you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. 
And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel, the gospel is proclaimed, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, would you give us courageous hearts to push past the bounds or the barriers or the things that may keep us back from fully understanding and worshiping and giving ourselves into worship with you, Lord. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, that's, that's a hard movie. It's a hard scene. This is a hard passage. As you think about this woman, Mary, coming into the room and she begins to make everybody uncomfortable because she's so poured out and sold out for Jesus. And it makes me think about what are the things that I'm willing to pour myself out for? What are the things that I'm willing to pour myself out for? Maybe you find yourself asking that question. The most valuable thing I was thinking of is my kids and my wife. They're really the only people that I would stay up or wake up at 2 a.m. for. They're really the only people that uh, I have nightmares uh, all the time about getting hurt or about, they're the only people that I would, uh, you know, probably say that I would change their diapers. They're, the, uh, they're sometimes the, the most valuable people in my life that, that I tear up over continually in prayer. Are there things in your life that you value so much that you don't mind doing and pouring yourself out for those things, for those people? in your lives. We'll see here, Mary, and, and we find out in the other Gospels, her name is Mary. This woman, she gets it. She gets Jesus' supreme value and worth. She understands it. And then she sets forth this example for us. It happens in the time of the unleavened bread. So if, if you look back just in the verses 1 through 2, you find out that Jesus is meeting uh, with the disciples, the bread didn't have, uh, so the idea of unleavened or the festival of unleavened bread was that the, the idea of the celebration was that the bread didn't have time to rise before they left Egypt. It was sudden. If you remember, this ties into the Olivet Discourse where Jesus said that he was going to come unexpectedly. Yes. You remember he kept saying, be on, be on guard, be uh, be alert, don't miss this. And so the unleavened bread was a, a way of just kind of sealing home that anticipation of Jesus coming. And then we have this beautiful passage where this woman really prepares Jesus for burial and she doesn't know that she's doing that. She prepares him because at the end of this week, remember we're still in the Passion Week, Jesus is going to go to the cross He's going to pay the price for our sins and make us right with God by, by faith. And so then we get this, that she's going to be remembered wherever the gospel is proclaimed throughout all history. That's pretty extraordinary. And so I want to set forth this idea that maybe we learn to worship like Mary worshiped. Can we do that this morning? Can we look at how she worshiped and can we learn from her example? Because obviously Jesus saw her as an incredible example of worship. Let's talk about worship itself. If you remember last summer, we went through a series and we talked about what is worship? What is worship? I'm going to see, this is your participation moment um, in the sermon. What is worship? How would you describe worship? Pastor Shane described worship. Love. Praising God. What's the root word? Worthship. Worthship. It means when you worship something, you're ascribing value. You're, ex you're ascribing value and worth to it. You're saying this is immense. This is incredible. This is, this is worthy of my worship. It's worth. Ship. If something is worthy enough to you, you will take extreme measures to make it a big deal, right? That is the essence of worship. And so I describe worship as worth-ship. You are ascribing value to your God and to your Savior. You're saying he value, He's important to me. He's valuable. He's precious to me. And so when you worship, you come and say, we ascribe value the unfortunate thing is that we find ourselves in a culture today 
that things have become cheaper and cheaper as they become more and more convenient. More and more convenience often means that we will go out of our way less and less to engage in it, won't it? When things become more, have you ever noticed uh, this happens in a lot of our different, uh, in our subscription world, and I'm going to get into this. I have a, a deep theory, and it's that music has been made cheap and unvaluable today. Because if you notice the subscription model, you, get, you, you pay monthly and you get access to all the music in the world all the time. And so what does that do to each individual song? It becomes cheap. It becomes easy. It becomes cheap and easy. See, too many of us treat the church like this. It's become cheap and easy for us to attend. It requires very little from us to participate in. And then we wonder why we have a value issue when it comes to gathering for God's word with God's people to sing God's songs. It's because it requires so little of us and we don't really like to pay what we used to when it comes to that. I, I don't know if you noticed at the end of our music today, we sang a song, it's called It Is Well. I don't know, did you guys notice that some of our older saints, we sang those first songs and those are good for us younger people. We've, we've heard them before, good, good father. But did you see that some of the older saints kind of get up a little taller, expand their diaphragm? It is well. And they were like, where have you been? This is awesome. That's because for a lot of you, that song has a great deal of meaning to it, doesn't it? Maybe you remember loved ones. Maybe you remember singing that in church as you were a kid. There's a value to that song. There's a worth to that worship, isn't there? There's kind of that idea that the sense of the, the church has become so convenient and we've catered to so many different opinions and different ways of doing things that it's become so easy, it's become cheap. Church has become cheap. When Mary steps into this room, she instantly displays and shows everybody in that room how important Jesus is to her beyond everything. And she does a couple of things. She shows us in a couple of different ways. She, number one, shows us that Jesus is worth more to her than money. She first shows us that Jesus is worth more than money. Let's talk about this alabaster jar that she breaks open. This was something that was very expensive. How many of you remember how much it cost to get your first car? Do you remember? It was probably a little less than the cars cost today. But you were very excited about that car. This alabaster jar would have been around that same type of value. It's hard to say because we live in a different world today, but it would have been something like uh, thousands of dollars. We're looking at several months, six, six or so months worth of, of a salary during a day. This was a big, lavish item. It was rare. It was hard to have. And you would typically be passed down among your family members. And it was for a burial. It was for a funeral. And so for her to take what was her family's, rightfully, this was her family's, to take the wealth of her family and pour it, break it, and pour it out at the feet of Jesus was showing everybody in that room that money pales in comparison to the surpassing worth of my Savior. That was worth ship. There was nobody in that room that questioned the fact that she saw Jesus as invaluable. And so she came into that room and she said that Jesus is worth more than money. This is a principle among Scripture. I think about a passage uh, in 1 Peter says, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers, not with, let's see, what were we not ransomed with? perishable things such as silver and gold. I think that's very interesting because many of us, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Randy and our gold digging, right? Like we're, during the summer, the church has this plot of land where we get to go and we get to pan for, for gold and the stuff. And you work super hard in the creek and you're panning for that gold and you get a couple of flakes. We did it with Randy this last summer, me and my kids. And you hold up this tiny little vial full of gold and you go, Yes! all the last six hours of work and I got these tiny little flecks I'm so excited about. But here it almost seems like those things are like nothing 
to the immense value of Jesus, but with the precious. The ascription of value is not for silver or gold. It's almost like this passage Peter is saying, those are, those are not worth nearly as much as the blood of Christ himself. Like, the, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So Jesus is worth more than money. She poured out the best that she had. This is clearly the best that she, she had. And so my question for us today is how do we as God's people make this proclamation? How do we make sure that we tell our own hearts and the people around us that Jesus is clearly worth more than the things that we have? Well, it means pouring them out, much like she did. It makes me it reminds me when I was a college pastor, we had this summer missionary program, and I had this college student, and he had his first car, and he was super excited about it. And uh, but he didn't have a job, and he didn't have much money. And we talked about, hey, we have this summer mission opportunity, and uh, I, I told him, I think you're a shoe in. And he said, you know, I, I really, I need to make money this summer. I, I'm living on top ramen already. I don't know how I'm going to make it through college. And he said, I got to get a, a job that's going to actually make money, okay? And I said, okay, well, you pray about it. You pray about it. And he came back, and you know what he did? He's like, you know, Shane, I know that serving my Lord is more important to me than the things in this world. He went and sold his first car. So that he could make it the next the next semester, he sold his car so that he could be a summer missionary, which changed the trajectory of his life. But he saw that something he valued. You guys remember that love you have for your first car? Some of you, your love for that first motorcycle. Can you imagine what it would say to the world, right? And so this college student, he said, and he, you know, he was able to save up enough eventually to get a car again. I gave him a lot of rides. But a lot of people would have looked at what Mary was doing by breaking this alabaster jar, and they said instantly their, their thought was, that's a waste. Have you ever seen somebody do something and you go, that's a total waste? Like your kids and the food that you put in front of them, and they don't eat it? Is that just a me thing? It either goes, it either goes in my tummy, which I don't need more, or it goes in the, in the garbage. Dads, can I get an Amen. Right, And, and the, there's this sense that it feels like a waste. It feels like a waste. You get this sense that the room feels what she is doing is so wasteful, but she gets something that others do not. Again, the surpassing value of Christ. She's willing to what the Scriptures say, kill the fatted calf. This principle of killing the fatted calf was when something occurred that was so worth it, you would only kill the fatted calf to celebrate, to lavish over something that was a big, 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 big deal. It's not like the beef that we have access to now today where we get steak every night if you want. right? It was like this was a big, big celebration. The idea of killing the fatted calf. This was brought home to me when I was a college pastor and I'd, I'd invite starving college students to my house and I would cook a steak on my grill for them. And some of them would almost tear up as grown men because they were so excited to have a steak because they were living on top ramen. Um, so kill the fatted calf. So the waste, they, they would have viewed it as wasteful, but she gave the best that she had. She killed the fatted calf. This is what she had, and she brought it to the Lord in worship. It makes me think, and I've already talked about this a little bit, the subscription model that we have applied to so many different aspects of our life. Have you ever noticed how many different subscriptions you have? Have you ever counted them? Younger people, some of you, you have a subscription to Netflix, you have a subscription to Hulu, you have a subscription to Disney Plus, you have a subscription then to Spotify or Pandora. Anybody have subscriptions to where you can't even remember how many subscriptions you have? It's a real problem today, right? But what it essentially does is it just makes it convenient and easy to gorge yourself on different types of entertainment. You guys ever noticed uh, that now when you watch a movie, maybe you don't enjoy them as much as you did when you were a kid? Do you remember that? There's certain shows that you watch, and um, I was trying to explain to my kids this idea of this thing called commercials. 
because you had to endure commercials so you could get to your favorite show. Like there was a cost in it for you. I think the subscription method has absolutely destroyed our value system in today. We don't value art because it comes cheap. We don't value music. As AI gets into the game and is now able to create all the different elements of culture like art, music, and movies, which it's working on doing that without human input, um, there's this idea that it's going to get even cheaper still. All of those things, by the way, did you know that the root of all of those things was to worship the Lord? Art, to worship the Lord. Music, to worship the Lord. Entertainment. Why does he give us those things? Music and arts. That always, by the way, in, in the past, in history, art, music, and entertainment tended to drive culture. It tended to drive culture. That's why Christianity, when we put into the, the, the deepness of songs like, it is well with my soul, it changed culture, didn't it? But we've cheapened many of those songs and we've settled for what I'd call a bargain spirituality. A bargain spirituality. We look at where it's the most convenient, that it's, it's going to cost me the least amount of time and resources. I have a good friend that used to get up early in the morning, and he had, uh, I'd call it his science uh, project, and it was how he brewed coffee. And he'd sit down every morning, and he'd have this uh, set, and he'd pour the coffee in, and he'd have French press, and he'd measure it out, and it looked like he had beakers in there. I was like, what kind of science magic are you doing to your coffee? I was like, you know you can just put the, press the button on the drip coffee, right? Can I get an amen? I said, why do you do that? He said, it forces me to slow down and to pay the cost for my coffee. And he said, I found that I enjoy it more, that I value it more. How many of you multitask? Any multitaskers out there? Multitasking cheapens everything you do, doesn't it? You do so much that you forget the importance of some of the things that you do. In this bargain world or this bargain spirituality that we live in, I think as we look at Mary's example, frugality is okay. It's a real value here in Riverton in particular, but in Wyoming, we tend to really praise people who are able to be frugal. You guys know what frugal means? It's not, it's not just a, a funny word, but it just means that you are really good at saving, at conserving your money, at, at frugal. So like if you buy shoes, you only buy the bargain brand shoes because you like to save money. You're frugal with your money. You make it go further. So there's a sense that we've applied that same value on our spirituality with Christ, hasn't it? And we try to look at what's cheap and what's easy, and essentially it means that we lose value for what we're worshiping, because we're ascribing worth-ship. And frugality is okay, but there are times, brothers and sisters, that we need to be okay with being lavish on the kingdom. Amen? Frugality is to be honored, yes, but when it comes to the kingdom of God, we want to kind of learn from this experience with Mary. We want to be people who lavish on the kingdom of God and on His people. Amen? We want to be people who would pour out the best that we have for one another because that comes at a high value. And so the second thing that she shows us is that Jesus is worth more than her dignity. Jesus is worth more than her dignity. Mary was seen as the weird one in the room, wasn't she? So much so that she got down to other gospels tell us that she washed Jesus' feet with her hair even the disciples felt uncomfortable as she was sitting here doing like, what is this woman doing? What is this woman doing? She washes his feet, weeping, set her face to elevating him to top priority. This was, trans this was a transformation of her life priorities. She was coming and she was saying, I lay my dignity, my money and my dignity down at the feet of Jesus because he's worth more than both of those things. Anybody in easy? Does it ever keep you from doing something lavish for the kingdom of God? 
This was skin in the game of her faith. She put herself out there because she was certain in this moment that Jesus is the Christ, Emmanuel. He is God with us. So how do we make this same proclamation today? I want to propose that we get okay with being weird. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay to be weird. But only for the kingdom of God. Don't be weird for weird's sake, but be weird. I'm talking weird Christianity. For me, this was um, when I became a Christian in my testimony. I'll never forget I, my whole reason for being. I was into rough music and I was into, into all the different things of the world. And as I started to press into my relationship with God, my friends started to make comments like, Shane, we don't really like to drink around you anymore. Because you don't. And we don't really like to talk about some of these things anymore that we used to talk about. You make us feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I heard good, right? But I was weird. And you have to remember, like this is, I found my identity and the popularity of my friends at one point in my life, but my whole priority, my value system was being upended, making Jesus the more important person to be approved by. And so this is the same thing that this woman is coming. She's coming. She's saying, I, I, I'm okay with being weird because Jesus is more important to me. Do we screen our lives through the same lens of this worth-ship? If God is true, if Jesus is the real deal, how would it not change how we live, what we do? This is the Bible's permission to be the weird one in the room. It makes me think of a few years ago, Becky um, was out on the college campus uh, and she was putting out Christian posters. And it was at this particular time that we had a lot of feedback from people on campus that were telling us that we just made them feel awkward because we talked about Jesus a lot. And we shared Jesus a lot. And it just some of the Christians were even starting to say, you guys are sharing the gospel too much. You're too direct. You're too open with the gospel. You need to... It's, feeling a little awkward, you're going to put people off. And as we thought about that, Becky was going and handing out posters and she came into the science building and she put up a poster and it just so happened this professor saw her and he came up and asked her what she was doing. And uh, she, at that moment, thinking about what all the Christians had been telling her, she got really nervous. Am I making people awkward? Am I doing this the wrong way? Am I putting them off on Christianity? And so she kind of like did that awkward like kind of mouth vomit thing where she, she was like, uh, Jesus loves you, can I pray for you? That's how it went. Did I, act, I got her permission to share that story. And uh, he goes, yeah, actually, could you pray for me? And she prayed for him and, and moved on. Two weeks later, we were sitting in a meeting with our students and they said, you'll never believe what just happened in our science class. The professor was talking about one day he was just, he was done. He was frustrated. He was over life. And he sat in his office and he said, God, if you're going to talk to me, let it be today. And he was telling his class this. And he said, you'll never believe what happened that day. He said, some awkward girl came and prayed for me. And I, I don't know if the science teacher came to faith, but to me, that's clearly the work of the Holy Spirit, yes? I want you to embrace this idea of weird, awkward Christianity. We used to have this saying, awkward is awesome. Awkward is awesome. It is okay to be awkward. It is more important than your dignity to be sharing the gospel in whatever way you can. Embrace the awkward. Some of us are already weird, but are in danger of a religious attitude in response to this weirdness. And so the last thing that we see in the life of Mary uh, as she does this is Jesus is worth more than just doing good. Now, the religious response was, this is a waste, wasn't it? This is a waste. She's poured out something valuable. It could have gone to the poor. But I want you to think about her frame of mind was not... What is the highest good I can do? She just sees Jesus and wants to run and elevate him, yes? And so she, it's this principle of doing versus being. 
So many of us in our Christian walk have the mentality that I need to do more. I need to accomplish more. I need to polish my life up better. I got to do more good for more people. I want to caution you about that mentality because that's an exhausting mentality. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. And so doing is only out of being with Jesus. When we do good things, it's because we're pursuing Jesus. And if we come out there and we think we're going to solve the social ills and Jesus is going to be a partner alongside us solving poverty, clearly this passage is saying that Jesus is the highest priority. Doing is not going to accomplish nearly as much as being in Christ, being with him. There's scriptures that talk about abide in Jesus. And doing good things is not a bad thing. Can I say that? But you can do things and good things to the extent that it can harm your being with Jesus, which is a high, much higher scriptural priority for us as the saints, yes? Here's the, the principle as we unpack this. The, the disciples felt as though uh, there is more we could do than just pour out, uh, pour out on worship of Christ. The do more attitude leads to dissatisfaction all the time. Because here, Jesus says that the poor will always be with you. There's not a point where we're going to solve the social ills. And so if you go in hoping that what you do is going to solve the problem of sin, it's not going to work and you're going to come out dissatisfied. That's why we have something like the be attitudes is fulfilling in every way. When we are being with Jesus, our being with Jesus is a higher priority than what we accomplish, then we are going to be much more satisfied in our relationship, in our worthship with God. The goal is not that we would be world changers. Uh, my generation, the millennials, that was our big promise. At every conference we went to, we were told, you guys are going to change the world. And so we'd go out and we'd try and it didn't work, and we get frustrated, and then we get frustrated with us, and we get frustrated with the church because it's not doing enough, and then we get frustrated with the social ills, and, and we get frustrated with the government because they're not doing enough, and all it was was leading to this frustration, but the idea for believers, we were not meant to be world changers, but in loving Jesus, the world would be changed. Did you hear that? In loving Jesus, the world would be changed. There's a difference in mentality there. It's a, Matthew 25, 34 through 40 tells us. Um, let's see here. The king, uh, so it's talking about the least of these in the interest of time. Matthew 25, 30 through, 34 through 40. Jesus has this dialogue where he talks about the least of these verse. This is the least of these. And he says that you, uh, you at my right hand can come with me basically to heaven. And he says, because you fed me when I was hungry, you clothed me when I was naked, and you visited me in prison. Jesus' purpose in this passage is not that we would just feed people, that we would just clothe people, that we would just visit people in prison, but you need to hear this. At the end of it, he says, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least, of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What's the concept that Jesus is trying to illustrate here? It hinges on this idea of who is the brother? Who is the brother or the sister? This is the saints. We know Matthew 12, 50, tell, he, or yeah, 12, 50, he tells us, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. He defines for us who the least of these are. These are saints that we are to serve. These are the believers. These are the brothers and sisters because look around, guys. Look at these people in this auditorium. They bear with them the very presence and person of Jesus. When you place your faith in Jesus, he literally, you, you bring with you Jesus into every room you walk into. It's a part of what makes you weird. And that's awesome. 
But that least of these verse is about the brothers, the saints that carry the presence of Christ with them into every room. When we visit believers in prison, when we, visit, when we feed believers around the globe, that, that churches that are struggling, when we clothe the believer, we are doing that to Jesus himself. When you wash one another's feet, you are doing that to Jesus himself. When you serve one another on a Sunday morning, you do that to Jesus himself. Because the principle is believers are Jesus. They're the hands, the feet of Jesus. Jesus says, if you're going to do this to me, you have to do this with your brothers and sisters. That means you can't just come to church, sit in the back row, and then leave like nothing ever happened. Because you're not serving with Jesus. You're not worth shipping. You're not serving Jesus. You're not washing his feet. You're not breaking the alabaster jar like she did. And I want you to see at the end of this passage, this was a, an amazing investment for her. An amazing investment for her. See, eternal worship often looks weird and wasteful to the world today, but worship of Jesus never leaves us empty and actually pools into eternity. I want you to see at the end of Mark, turn to Mark 16.1. The end of Mark, Mark 16.1, you have this mention of this woman, Mary Magdalene. And at the end of the book of Mark, it says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and, did you see this word? Anoint him. What do you think they were taking? Spices. Nard. Things to anoint the body of Jesus. You know what they found? There was no body to anoint! It was empty. Mary already beat everybody to the punch. She did it while he was still with her. Do you see? She caught on to the idea of worship and its eternal value. And the, the body wasn't there because she had already anointed it for burial. Mary was blessed on that day. Can you imagine as women were like, we got to go take care of Jesus' body. And they look around like, well, there's no body. <laughs> Can you just imagine it dawn on Mary like, I don't have anything to bring to anoint his body. Oh, wait. The reason I don't have anything is because I've already poured out that worship on Jesus before he went to the tomb. Don't you want that to be the case that day you see Jesus? You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? You worshiped me. You lived a life. By the way, that's the abundant life, is that life of worship, worship of God. So what? Learn to lavishly worship Jesus. Let go of your dignity and embrace humility. And embrace God, God things over good things. I often say, drop one of the O's. Because there's an infinite amount of good things you can do, right? We want to be people who ask, what are the God things? Because sometimes the good things can get in the way of doing the God things. <clears throat> Small groups, uh, what do I have a hard time pouring out on Jesus and his people? And how can I practice this example of worship today? Would you discuss this in your small groups? I'm going to pray and close for us. And I believe we have a financial update um, from Rachel today. So for those of you who are members or are interested in the family business, stick around for about five minutes and Rachel will give us a heads up. But would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Would you check in with the Lord and ask, how can I walk in worship with you, Lord? Father God, we come here today and we want to pour out our lives. We don't want to serve some cheap God. We know that you are so much more. You are worth everything, everything. Lord, let us be people that are willing to pour ourselves out for you. Lord, we pray that in your good and holy name, Jesus. Amen.